So now to the exciting part of the afternoon, and uh, I just want to welcome uh, members of the general public who've come to join us. Uh, we're really pleased that uh, we've been able to attract uh, a broader audience than the specialists that work on food security. Um, now I know in part that's because uh, we have uh, Rex here and uh, uh, we're very excited that Rex uh, agreed to join us for the second time at this conference. Uh, he did a marvelous uh, job introducing and moderating uh, a debating question the last time around and I'm sure we will have just as much fun and swashbuckling this time as we did the, the last time around. So um, what I would like to do is just uh, introduce the, uh, the uh, debaters for the afternoon because uh, I know them a bit better than Rex does um, and then once, uh, uh, once I've done that I think I can hand over, I'll, we'll say a little bit about how we run the debate and then I can hand over and Rex will take, uh, take over as moderator. So uh, I'll just go, um, uh, basically I'll go from left to, my left to right, okay. So we've, over here we've got Professor uh, Dick Flavel and uh, Dick Flavel is a ch the chair of one of the major international wheat genomic initiatives right now, the Wheat Yield, Co uh, wheat Yield Consortium, or the Wheat Yield Partnership, Partnership now. Yeah, they changed the name. Um, and Dick previously was the uh, CEO and director, uh, executive director at the John Innes Center in Britain, which is one of the greatest plant science institutes in the entire world. So. Uh, we're very pleased to have you on board, Dick. Uh, next to Dick is Merit Tereski, and uh, Merit uh, has come to us from the University of Guelph. Uh, she's an eminent scientist in the area of uh, carbon cycling uh, in uh, holistic large um, landscape systems. And uh, as you can see from uh, the, the, uh, the title of the debate, we need somebody who can really take that on and talk to us a little bit about the complexity of the carbon flux between terrestrial systems uh, and the air. So thank you very much, Merritt, for coming uh, from the University of Guelph. Uh, on this side of the table, we have uh, Hannah Tuomisto. Uh, Hannah gave a, a great talk uh, earlier on today uh, on, a, on the topic, really, of, of what we're talking about today. Uh, Hannah is a professor in the uh, University of Helsinki in Finland, so she's also come a very long way. Um, but uh, she has published many papers on the basically the carbon footprint of agricultural systems and done some very good quantitative work to look at uh, interventions in agriculture and how that impacts uh, on the, uh, the, the, uh, both the energetic and carbon flux between uh, the, the farming system and the atmosphere. And then finally, one of our own, uh, Stuart Smythe, and Stuart is an agricultural economist in our College of uh, Agriculture and Bioresources. Uh, Stuart works very closely with the Global Institute for Food Security and has helped us greatly, although we have uh, very good uh, uh, science, experimental science, uh, what Stuart has been able to do is to turn, as a social scientist and economist, turn many of our ideas into questions about uh, social interactions with the, the general public, acceptability of certain types of technology, and also to get a sense as to many of these technologies, we have no idea how much they might be worth, and you re it requires a good economist to be able to quantify those things. So uh, we're very pleased that Stuart has uh, agreed to be one of our debaters. And then finally, let me just uh, uh, introduce, although it needs no real introduction, uh, our moderator for today, uh, Rex Murphy. Um, Rex uh, is, as you know, uh, a, a TV and uh, uh, newspaper journalist. Um, he's been uh, widely cited as the most intellectual journalist in Canada, and uh, that's not just me <laughs> saying it, but other people. Um, what I always remember about Rex, because uh, you may 
uh, may have heard him either on the national or uh, on the radio. He's got one of the best vocabularies of any journalist that I've interacted with over the years. And sometimes I've had to get a Webster's dictionary out <laughs> to find out what that word actually That's meant. True. So, but he was a Rhodes Scholar, studied in Oxford. So uh, he, uh, he he obviously came by this broad vocabulary uh, very honestly. So uh, it's it's a real privilege to have our debaters and Rex here uh, once again at, the, uh, at uh, this interesting debate. Now, I'll just say a couple of words about an IQ squared debate, and Rex will probably el elaborate on this, uh, and I'm going to leave you to actually call the question, right Rex, is that okay? So, um, which is right on our, on our crib sheet here. IQ square debates are a little bit different from what you might call the normal swashbuckling debates that we would have in Parliament, where you basically end up just deciding, is the motion passed or is it not? And you know, if you've got a large enough majority in Parliament, you win. An IQ square debate is a lot more nuanced, and really what we're hoping to do is to measure the ability of our debaters to persuade you from your current position to whatever position you end up with. And for that reason, what we're gonna do, uh, and if we can just show the website now behind me uh, on the screen, anybody who's uh, got a cell phone, a smartphone, if you can log in to this SurveyMonkey um, address, what you will find is the opportunity now to vote on this proposition. And the, uh, the proposition, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if it's actually on the website, so I'm going to tell you. Agriculture and forestry hold the solution to mitigating atmospheric CO2 and climate change. Okay, I'll say it again, because the proponents will be arguing that agriculture and forestry hold the solution to mitigating atmospheric CO2 and climate change. Now, you can vote, and this is now before you've heard any debate, you can vote for the proposition, against it, or you can be a not sure. The value of this debate is we're going to keep the results hidden. Uh, you just vote on them. You won't hear what the results of the pre-debate vote is until we finished. But we'll take the vote at the end after we've had the debate. And when we do, can everybody see the screen? And then when we do, we'll see just how much opinion has shifted. Now that is a measure of the quality of the discourse and that's a much more important factor for us. So we're gonna give you, we're gonna leave that up there, we're gonna give you two or three minutes to, to vote. Uh, but now what I'm gonna do is hand over to Rex and what I'll do Rex is just give you a signal when we're gonna turn this off so the voting will be finished. But if you would uh, like to take over, I'll, uh, I'll be quiet. Uh, Morris has done some uh, savage injustice here. Uh, he's referred to me as an intellectual journalist, <laughs> which is, of course, pure uh, paradox and oxymoron. <laughs> it belongs in the same camp as the military intelligence. You've heard of that before. <laughs> and also, of course, as, as far as being a journalist is concerned, uh, that's not a, not a justified description. Uh, I bear the same relationship to journalism as a streetwalker has to the Department of Highways. Uh, I give you these fragments of my Oprah background merely to let you know the capacity in which I am present here today. You see joining, uh, joining me here for distinctly uh, qualified, uh, intelligent, uh, earnestly and correctly uh, credentialed uh, experts uh, in their fields and of capacity and uh, genuine intelligence. So it was thought it was necessary to have a counter presence uh, during this exchange. <laughs> and so I'm here as uh, essentially the anticlimax and uh, the turnstile through which real wisdom and knowledge will flow. Uh, a few things about the debate. I think Morris uh, missed perhaps the contrast that's going on here. Uh, this type of debate is formal. There are time limits for the speakers of uh, 10 minutes apiece in their presentation for affirmative or negative, and then one each gets five minutes in rebuttal or summary at the end. Now this differs 
and I think to, to its disadvantage, actually, from the parliamentary debates that Morris alluded to, or even the leadership debates, at least here in Canada, we have. And I'll just give you a few places where they actually do, uh, we actually miss something. In this particular debate, <coughs> you'll be able to hear the speakers as they talk. Uh, yes. And they will also, in the majority, and I'm certain in this case, the totality of uh, instances, present a detailed, reasonable, argued presentation. Uh, they will not be marred by talking points, uh, by artificial screams of rage or shame, and by gibbering overtalk when one of the speakers loses his or her position. In other words, they will be confined to the question, uh, they will attempt to have some respect for the language. They will speak to the point, And therefore, in terms of political debate, they will be unlike any other that you have heard before. <laughs> and so it's a, it's a challenge to moderate uh, something as, as special as that. I am a fan of the old-fashioned ones. I don't know. I'm just killing time while you take advantage of the, um, the thing to load your iPhones. I saw Mr. Smythe over there busily voting already. I don't know what he's doing, but he's very clever at it. Uh, we, may, we miss the, the quality of uh, old-fashioned debates, and this, especially, this is true, uh, quite literally, at this instant. Uh, it's almost like the great collision of the planetary orbs and the cosmological collapse when the Twitter feed met the presence of Mr. Trump, and uh, suddenly all human knowledge was exploded and scattered uh, into a wide void. Uh, so I miss the old-fashioned ones when you could actually, as I said, you, you actually listen to the person who had prepared his or her thoughts and argued them with dispassion and respect to reason. Also, there was a touch of elegance in those old days. Uh, I'm, I'm gambling in my mind, even as I mutter away up here, uh, whether I could tell you the most brutal uh, parliamentary exchanges. I'm sure some of you know it. Gladstone and Israeli were always at each other's very top parts anyway. And you remember there was a classic uh, description of uh, Disraeli of Gladstone where he referred to him as a sophistical rhetorician uh, inebriated by the exuberance of his own verbosity <laughs> who can at all times command an interminable series of arguments to malign an opponent or to justify himself. That's the kind of elegance you don't get these days certainly not on the Twitter feeds of certain illustrious people. And you can even drop down to Winston Churchill, who had, I thought, a rather zealous and praiseworthy nasty side. And he referred to Mr. Attlee, as you, I'm sure you know, as a very modest little man with much to be modest about. <laughs> and on another occasion said that being under fire from Clement Attlee was like being savaged by a dead sheep. Uh, we don't get these, these pearls. Uh, I got one slightly vulgar one, and I, I hesitate because it is slightly vulgar. I am so antique that I don't like using even the trivial vulgar, but this one can't survive without the vulgarism. You don't think of Lyndon Johnston normally as Oscar Wilde in any capacity, but at one point he, he described Gerald Ford as being so stupid that he couldn't pour piss out of a cowboy boot if the instructions were written on the heel. <laughs> my last one, and this will cause shock within the room and probably get me ejected, but it's not my language. It's the Earl of Sandwich, but I'm going to ascribe it to the Israeli just because it makes it easier to talk about. They had a great clash in Parliament. This is the last one. I'm going to get to the real people. Uh, this is the last one. They had the big clash. Gladstone, as usual, in, in that context, lost. And he emerged into the lobby of the great British House of Commons, fuming with rage, smoke coming out of his various orifices, and went on under the chin of the Israeli, looking up at him and saying, my friend, you will die either on the gallows or on some horrible disease. To which the Israeli replied, that depends, my friend, on whether I embrace your policies or your mistress. <laughs> <laughs> Told you it was savage. Anyway, I know nothing in terms of the science that's engaged in this particular proposition. As I say, my function here is to be a neuter and an anticlimax, and merely to do two things, I believe. 
and that is to keep a reasonable eye on the, the time limits that are extended. They're generous, 10 minutes per speaker in the first round. Uh, we're a, a very easy uh, audience here, and I'm especially easy today because <clears throat> not long ago I was in Newfoundland, and to come from Newfoundland to Saskatoon is, uh, I feel I'm in Tahiti or something. <laughs> and if anyone here has a hula dress, I'll be glad to put it on. Uh, so I'm in a very forgiving mood, so I, I, you, know, you don't have to kill the sentence before you get to the predicate, 30 seconds more or less to wind the thought down, but not beyond that. And then there will be the intermission, then prior, then the rebuttal, and, and uh, five minutes per each speaker. So there, there's really not much uh, more, I don't think, unless now Morris, if I skip many things and made a ball of it already? Everything is okay? Everybody should have voted by now. Uh, we've, uh, we've taken down the, uh, uh, the website, but uh, we'll put it up again at the end of the debate so people can re vote. Okay. Well, and then I call upon our first speaker, Dr. Hannah Tumistu, please. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. And uh, so I'm speaking for the statement that uh, agriculture and forestry hold the best hope for humanity to mitigate atmospheric CO2 and uh, climate change. And uh, now I assume that everybody knows what uh, climate change uh, is and why we need to mitigate uh, uh, CO2. And uh, so my first statement is that, uh, uh, that uh, it's actually already happening. So this is already uh, partly done because if we look at the historic uh, uh, CO2 emissions, the emissions are actually increasing much more than the CO2 concentration in the uh, atmosphere. And that's a lot to do with the uh, uh, greening effect. So basically the forests and uh, agriculture, land and all other vegetation is actually growing faster and capturing already, already much more uh, carbon from the atmosphere. But of course we can do much more. And, um, and uh, basically the first thing that we could do is, uh, or the most effective way, is to grow more forests everywhere where we can, and, um, and also avoid reforestation. Okay, uh, there may be one argument that the uh, opposing part is going to say is the um, albedo effect. So in the, in the north, in some areas, it uh, might be actually better to not to grow forest because if there is, uh, um, uh, ice and, uh, and snow, it uh, reflects uh, uh, more heat uh, away, and uh, so then it's not a good idea to convert that land area for, for forest because it's darker, and then this darker surface uh, uh, absorbs more heat, and it, the uh, total effect is a net uh, uh, warming effect. Uh, but in otherwise, we have lots of areas in, uh, in Asia and uh, especially in Brazil uh, where we could grow uh, trees back and also avoid uh, further conversion of, uh, of forest to agriculture land. And uh, uh, then of course uh, breeding like new species of trees so that we could uh, have faster growing trees um, and then also using this wood for buildings and all sorts of uh, materials. So, so basically, when we build a, a house from using tr wood, then that's kind of like a, a quite long carbon stock that is stored in, in that building. And in the forest where the wood was taken from, new trees will, will grow, and, uh, and then that's a net carbon sequestration effect. And now, of course, this uh, hot term, bioeconomy, which is everywhere. So basically, we should uh, make everything from uh, uh, renewable materials, uh, wood and uh, plants. And so ba basically, then we would uh, store more carbon, uh, at least in short term, in, in, in all materials that we use. Um, and then um, one of the most important things where we should start this uh, conversion of, uh, of uh, land to forest, it is all peat lands. 
because from those lands there are there are really high uh, CO2 emissions, especially if we use peatlands for agriculture, like in Finland. Uh, okay, it's a small country and very very small contribution to the total greenhouse gas emissions in the in the world, but 50% uh, of our greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture come from these uh, peatlands that are used for, for agriculture. So the f first thing how we could, in Finland, we could cut 50% of greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture would be to convert those lands to uh, permanent pastures or, or forests. Um, and then what we can do in agriculture. So, so basically, uh, in many places we have heard that no-till would be the option, uh, but and conservation agriculture reduced uh, tillage where, where uh, we don't use uh, plowing at all. Uh, but there is a little bit controversial uh, science behind that because uh, it looks like that uh, no-till always uh, doesn't uh, have net uh, um, C, uh, carbon reduction, especially if we take into account the nitrous oxide emissions that may be uh, increased from um, no-till systems. And then also regarding the um, carbon storage in the, in the soil, there is evidence that, the, that it's mainly uh, stored or the increase in, in the carbon in the soil is happening in the in the top layer of uh, of the soil, but not on the lower layers. And then there may be also a little bit like a transition between the carbon from the lower layer layers to the top layers. So there is not actually net carbon sequestration happening. But then there is a little bit conflicting results from different uh, regions in the world. So in in some areas. Uh, it can actually um, have net carbon sequestration as well. Uh, but there are many other ways how we could uh, increase uh, carbon storage in the soils in, in agriculture, and, um, and also how we could uh, reduce uh, greenhouse gas uh, emissions from, from agriculture. And um, so one of the important ways is to use uh, deep-rooted uh, crops. So uh, legume crops uh, and uh, also clover has really deep roots and when the crop is uh, harvested, the roots will, will stay in the, in the soil and they will uh, increase the, the carbon uh, storage in the soil. And then we could also, uh, so generally cereals, maize and uh, wheat, they have very small roots. And uh, so one uh, option could be to, to breed new crops that have, uh, uh, also cereal crops that have really deep uh, roots. Um, and then also adding organic uh, matter inputs into the soil, so leaving straw in there using cover crops, and, uh, and then uh, uh, maybe using biochar, which is, uh, uh, we could um, uh, make biochar by a pyrolysis process, so it's basically high temperature that produces uh, uh, char uh, from, for example, wood, and then also uh, gas and uh, oil that can be used for energy and other purposes, and this, if we, uh, put this uh, char into the soil, it's, there is uh, some evidence that it, it can actually stay there for really long time, so much, much longer than from other organic inputs. Um, and then we, we can improve the manure management uh, systems and grazing, optimize the grazing so that uh, the carbon storage in the soils is, uh, is increased. Um, and then also uh, uh, breed higher yielding crops, improve the nutrient use efficiency and water use efficiency that we get more yield from, from a land area, which would also help us to, to save more land for, for forests. And uh, also uh, if we would reduce the 
consumption of livestock products and maybe develop these uh, new uh, technologies for producing food, ver vertical farming, and the, uh, the cellular agriculture processes that I presented earlier, then those would save even much more land uh, from agriculture to, to forests and uh, carbon mitigation. 30 seconds. 30, okay. Uh, and uh, so I'm almost dead. <laughs> so then how can we make it this all happen so that it's economically uh, possible? So Stuart will talk more about that, but also if we could implement uh, uh, payments for ecosystem services, because all of these practices, they have also many other benefits for ecosystems like uh, biodiversity, wa water filtration, flood control, and uh, soil improvements. So in that way, we could also make these economically feasible. Thank you very much. Well, thank you uh, very much, Doctor. And now I will call upon Professor Richard Favell. Please, sir, the microphone is yours. Thank you. So, good afternoon. You're an astute audience, and so you certainly don't want to make conclusions based on sound bites, dumb downs, or scientific uh, uh, bits of uh, poorly selected information. You want the real story. Well, s science tells us that managing greenhouse gas accounting is very complex, and we certainly cannot rely on land managers in their millions all over the world to solve the problem. That's socially and economically naive, and knowing the world uh, as it really is, uh, you'll certainly vote against this motion. Uh, we all know that global warming and CO2 increases have happening, been happening for 100 years and more, but all that time agriculture has become increasingly intense. Now that fact alone tells you that agriculture is not the solution, it has not mitigated global warming. In fact, all the studies show that agriculture is the problem, not the solution. Uh, consequently, continuation of agriculture as we know it, in all its diverse forms, cannot achieve the proposition in this debate, even recognizing all the new knowledge that's been gained in the past few decades. We'd have to look at a different agriculture and forestry, one that is greenhouse neutral uh, or negative. But creating such a radical change against the background of managing climate change itself and the need for every one of the millions of farmers to make a living for the growing world population to be fed, for pests and diseases to be managed, world trade to be sustained, right subsidies to be sorted out, political preferences to be justified, all that looks truly a hopeless dream. It seems an unattainable challenge to rely on a radically different, different agriculture to achieve mitigation of greenhouse gas accumulation. You will certainly agree. <laughs> the changes have to transcend uh, space and time, not one field, one environment, one crop, one continent, one year, one decade, but you have to see the system as a whole globally over many decades. Carbon can take decades to accumulate but be lost from soils in a day. Greenhouse gases are not national. Wherever they accumulate or are lost, affects the planet. Let's take a, for a moment a, briefer, a deeper look into what agriculture does to affect greenhouse gas levels. Yes, plants take CO2 out of the atmosphere in photosynthesis, but only in the growing seasons and not during the night when there's no sunlight. The rest of the time, ag systems release greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Yes, the more CO2 that has accumulated in the atmosphere has led to greater uh, fixation rates of carbon uh, some of the time. Uh, but it's the complexity behind the biology of photosynthesis that we need to factor in. You see, photosynthesis is driven by nitrogen. A plant is full of the Risco enzyme complex to carry out photosynthesis, but that's a protein and it's built from nitrogen. Massive innovations have occurred, as we know, to create plants with more photosynthesis, high yields, more profit, but this requires more nitrogen fertilizer. Uh, 
but that takes fossil fuel energy uh, to uh, produce. And so there's a trade-off in greenhouse gas accounting. Adding more nitrogen to soils to fix more carbon uh, also creates larger emissions of nitrous oxide and, and methane because there's lots of bacteria in the soil nitrifying and denitrifying. And here's another trade-off for greenhouse gas statistics. Similarly, there are trade-off statistics of the energy used to make and spray herbicides and fungicides. Plants are very sophisticated organisms. The regulation of photosynthesis is, is exquisite. Uh, and if there's not much nitrogen, photosynthesis stops. If there's not much water, photosynthesis stops. Uh, when there's no outlet for the fixed carbon and too much is accumulated, the plant respires it and turns the CO back into the atmosphere. If there's too much sugar, the product accumulated, then photosynthesis shuts down. Uh, Photosynthesis gets inhibited by higher temperatures. And what does global warming do? In certain places, it hires the temperatures. So you see, plants are self-regulating, and there are many trade-offs being generated in real time. So just because you've got more CO2 in the atmosphere doesn't say uh, that you get an equivalent response of carbon being taken out by photosynthesis. So given all these features of plants and many more that I could say if I had uh, 10 days instead of 10 minutes, uh, and the trade-offs in agriculture and forestry, why would we ever begin to think that agriculture and forestry are a solution uh, to mitigate uh, greenhouse gas accumulation? You're for sure going to vote against this, I can see it. So for agriculture and forestry to lead to any kind of solution to rising CO2 levels, they, it, th these processes clearly have to be globally very different from now, while continuing, of course, to feed the world with food, feed, and fiber. So how can they be different? What mitigation strategies can be adopted? Well, many are known a theory. The scientific journals are full of them. Some of them are actually practiced in some places, no-till agriculture, uh, adding less fertilizers, using slow-release fertilizers, using nitrification inhibitors, but all these do take up energy to be made and, and uh, applied. Managing water supplies would also help. Avoiding waste, as we heard yesterday, could contribute. We can imagine that precision ag systems, where expensive machines are monitoring potential greenhouse gas economics as fields are being planted, managed, and harvested, uh, would be great. Clearly, creating plants that do not have these feedback checks on photosynthesis so they continue to uh, take a lot more carbon out of the atmosphere uh, than, than plants currently would be great. Plants that have uh, much better uh, nitrogen utilization efficiencies would be great. And there's, there's super exciting work uh, on all these features uh, that's filling the journals, and I have no doubt that uh, uh, they will be achieved. But it will take a long, long time. Uh, you know, if it's a great idea in, in this conference, then it's probably going to take uh, maybe 20 years uh, to get it uh, reduced to practice, taken up for the first, by the first farmers. Um, and probably to be taken up by the farmers at scale, it's going to take, uh, well, it's in, in decades. And quite honestly, we don't have that time. So there's lots to be, uh, that could be done, uh, but they all have trade-offs. And uh, so without doing uh, full accounting of greenhouse gas uh, situations, uh, you can come to naive conclusions, the sort that this audience would never make, uh, and that's why you're going to vote against the, uh, the proposition. The timescales are really, really important. I've, I've uh, said that in, no matter how much uh, innovation takes place, it takes a long time to get these things to be adopted. But in addition to those kinds of adoptions, you know, will the, will the governments ever get the right laws in place rapidly enough around the world? 
Will, will industries change fast enough around the world? Will people vote for changes in their lifestyles fast enough? No, 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 uh, I say on a global scale. Very importantly, can farmers be expected to find and manage fast enough the sweet spots in these trade-offs between adapting to climate change on the one hand, keeping the emissions down, on the other, conserving carbon in soils, both for soil sustainability and greenhouse gas uh, mitigation. This is a very big thing to ask millions of farmers to do. Come on. This is not a, 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 a paper in an academic journal. This is facing a reality. Uh, I think just even sorting out the quotas that, that farmers would need to address uh, is, is a tall order. So while all this complexity is being managed, greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture are continuing to pile up and not really being mitigated. Now, as an academic, uh, I get what is possible in theory, and that's the problem. Uh, the real world is different. Getting all these diverse innovation trade-offs right in all the places across the globe to make agriculture and forestry the solution for mitigating climate change is a pipe dream. Too much change is required, too much innovation required in too short a time. So believe you me, you will be being biologically naive, politically naive, and failing to bring others to a proper understanding of potential solutions if you vote in favor of this motion. But don't lose hope and, and optimism because changes in agriculture can play their part but it will take a lot more than agriculture and forestry to bring greenhouse gas accumulation into line. Vote against the motion. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, am I all right to call you this time? Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> okay. come this time. Uh, Dr. Stu uh, Stuart Smythe, sir. Thank, thank you, Rex. Have you finished voting? <laughs> So in your, your introduction, I was reminded of a great line by uh, Mark Twain when he said, while I didn't attend the funeral, I sent a letter wholeheartedly endorsing it. <laughs> so thank you to, to Morris and Jiffs for the invitation this afternoon. And, and while my esteemed colleague would appear to have just finished reading A Bleak Midsummer's Night, I'm here to, to give you the, um, no one likes ants at a picnic and, and, and like a debate, there's nothing like a few facts to, to clarify uh, what, what really is going on. So we've just finished working on an assessment of, of how greenhouse gas um, emissions and, and sequestration has functioned within the province of Saskatchewan. <clears throat> to be compliant with the, the Paris Accord, Saskatchewan would have to reduce uh, emissions by about 20 megatons. And just through forestry alone, we're at, at 52 percent. Agriculture is pretty much a wash when we work in um, the applications of, of fertilizer, nitrogen-based fertilizers. So it, it's been a, um, a marginal sink for the last four years in our province, given that we've transitioned from so much uh, weed tillage intensive agriculture to uh, zero and minimum tillage land management systems. We've removed about 12 million acres of summer fallow just in Saskatchewan over the last uh, 20 years. So that's a substantial advancement to, to a more uh, sustainable and, a, and also a technology that, that helps sequester greenhouse gas emissions on an annual basis. So with crop agriculture being sort of a, a, a neutral on this one, really forestry is, is where the advantage is going to be. I was fortunate enough to, to be at a, an event last fall and was talking to a group of environment, smaller group of environmentalists sort of about where are some of the options or where can innovation happen within agriculture and forestry to really make a substantial difference? So if, if we take the forest we've got in northern Saskatchewan, which is counting now for 52% of, of the reduction in, in Saskatchewan's emissions, and I said to them, what would happen if we came up with genetically modified trees? So there's research that's going on right now. There's a couple of papers that came out in 2016 that show uh, in laboratory research, they've been able to 
create plants that can increase their ability to sequester carbon by 20%. I was talking to the president of, of Metabolics a little over a year ago, and he said they had a variety of corn that they found in field trials was reducing or increasing its carbon sequestration by 35 to 40%. So I said to the, this small group of um, environmental organization, I said, what could happen to your perspectives about biotechnology, genetic modification, and, and greenhouse gas emissions, climate change, if we could come up with trees that could re increase carbon sequestration by, let's say, 35%, one-third. And there was kind of silence why I walked through this idea to the room. And then talking to them afterwards, they said, this is an absolute game changer. I said, we typically have been opposed to GM crops and to biotechnology. But if we could go out and we could plant a tree in our backyard and know that that tree is going to be increasing carbon sequestration for the next you know, 50, 80 years, depending on where you live, that is a real game changer. It allows us to take an entirely new perspective on how we look at innovation within agriculture. So the fact that we have proven technology already in laboratory and, and field trial use of, of plants being able to increase their ability to sequester carbon by anywhere from 20 to 40 percent, we've got forestry in Saskatchewan right now that's doing 50 percent at the level it's able to sequester. Richard talked about how we, we don't have decades. That's right. If we could, you know, modify trees within the next eight to ten years and start introducing those as uh, saplings into replanting forests, certainly in Canada, but most of the northern climates. That would give us a real leg up in a lot of countries. So instead of talking about 50% just through, through forestry, if we were able to increase that by, say, a third, we'd be now talking that 70, you know, 70%, 75% of the requirement GHG reductions could simply be achieved through the forest, proper forest management. So I think that really opens up, it gives us a, a really new perspective on how science can contribute to looking at greenhouse gas mitigation and climate change strategies. So I would suggest that, that we're not looking at a bleak midsummer's night. We're looking at a very um, positive, a very uh, exuberant, a, you know, almost a, a parade or a carnival-like approach to, to looking at the next few years around climate change and, and really how there's a tremendous opportunity if we look at removing some of the barriers to innovation. Right now it takes um, three to four years in some countries to, to get approval for a genetically modified plant, if it can be approved at all. Europe simply will not approve any of these uh, for planting. But how would that change within a European perspective if now they could put it into a forestry situation? It's not something that's going to be directly consumed. The, the product of that's not going to be directly consumable. Um, put it into your hardwoods and your timbers. So I think it opens up a, a real opportunity to look at where the barriers to this type of innovation might exist and, and how can science help look at some of these barriers, identify some of the costs of these barriers, and try to get them out of the way so that that enables or frees up science to, to move at a faster pace. Richard's right. You know, we don't have 20 or 30 years to sit around and, and figure out how to manage these things. We, we need to, to fast track some of these innovations. Genetically modified crops have been grown globally for 25 years now. There hasn't been environmental issues around them. So instead of requiring eight or 10 years worth of research and three or four years of field trials, what if we fast track this technology? It's already proven in existence. We just need to start putting it into forestry products and in three to five years, we could have these uh, trees in nurseries and by the end of the decade, uh, rolling out into forestries around the world. So I think that innovation in science in, in forestry, at the forestry aspect of agriculture, offers a fantastic solution, a fantastic opportunity to really change the perspective. And, and I'm really hopeful that, uh, you know, a little bit of optimism will drive home the fact that we're on the right side of this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, Dr. Merritt, is it you next? It is. Please. Thank you for all sticking in. So I want to begin with something we can all agree on. 
we have a carbon problem. But our problem is actually black carbon. So we're taking fossil fuel carbon or black carbon out of the uh, ground and we're emitting it to the atmosphere and this is causing global warming. So there are a variety of other kinds of carbon. There's blue carbon, coastal carbon or wetland carbon. There's green carbon and this is what we're talking about today, biological carbon on land. Now green carbon seems like one of the cheaper and more feel good ways to solve climate change. Green carbon is often described as a win-win. Win-win scenarios are appealing. So green carbon is often viewed as being good for soil fertility, right? Sequestering more carbon in our soils, great for soil fertility. It's also gonna save our climate. Everybody loves soils, right? So how could we not embrace green carbon? But it's not a win-win. It's a win-wish a win for agriculture, and a wish for climate. Or even worse, it's a win, hope it's all gonna work out. And that's really dangerous. So I'm gonna argue today that green carbon um, needs to be viewed very cautiously for three reasons. First, green carbon is distracting us from our real problem, our black carbon problem. Biological mitigation will not allow us to bypass any of the hard work in reducing our emissions. The only real way to deal with our carbon problem is to not emit that carbon in the first place. Now this is not going to be easy, and decarbonization is one of our great challenges, perhaps our greatest challenge. But consider headlines like this. Sucking carbon out of the air will solve climate change, or Farming out global warming solutions, buying time to develop alternative technologies. When people read headlines like this, it's a distraction from the real problem. We have a carbon problem, and anything that diverts our attention from this is actually making the situation worse. We need to do whatever we can to reduce our emissions, these kinds of emissions. The second reason that biological mitigation is risky is that we can't guarantee its permanence. Biological stocks of carbon, particularly on land, will always be subject to reversals. Increased wildfire, pest, and insects, drought. We have no control over these disturbances, and they're increasing with warming. In some of my own studies, I've measured how wildfires can combust and release hundreds of years of accumulation in a matter of mere minutes. This puts any reforestation project at risk. Fire and insect outbreaks have already converted Canada's managed forests from net sinks to net carbon sources. So I think it would be really unwise to think that we have the management tools to minimize those risks. We don't. And this applies to below ground carbon as well, which will always be subject to reversal during drought. So biological mitigation is dangerous because of non-permanence or this risk of reversal. It's also a stark reminder of the difference between this and this. These are not the same things, not the same kinds of carbon. The third reason we need to be cautious about green carbon is that these strategies are often not practical. The Rothamsted and other long-term experiments show that soil carbon saturates over time. Soils don't, simply don't keep accumulating carbon more and more forever. And this is why soils cannot solve climate change. And there are trade-offs with other ecosystem services, trade-offs with nutrients. Large applications of manure or compost certainly can increase soil organic matter, but they often lead to increased phosphorus and nitrate runoff. Where I live near the, Great, the uh, Great Lakes and the Lake Erie watershed, this is unacceptable. Trade-offs with food. Removing marginal land and converting it to wetland or prairie worked in the Rothamsted experiment to achieve climate stabilization. But adopting these practices would have pretty big impacts on global food production. There are also practical challenges for farmers. Despite climate benefits, farmers today are growing fewer and fewer perennials. And one reason is because there are so few cash crop perennial options. And this is why biofuels are really appealing, at least second generation biofuels. But to achieve meaningful climate benefits, 
a huge land area would need to be used, including converting agricultural land to biofuels. We are simply running out of land. Only about 10% of the ice-free land surface remains available for human uh, management of biomass. We need some of that land to feed 9 billion. We need some of it for urban development. We need space for reforestation projects. There is simply not enough land to accommodate everything. And for this reason, green carbon projects are often at odds with each other, competing for this very same limited land base. So green carbon is simply not that practical. We need to feed a growing world, and we're running out of space. So I've provided three arguments for why green carbon needs to be viewed cautiously. It's a distraction, it's non-permanent, and it's not practical. It's also simply not backed up by evidence. So most studies agree that with current technology, the potential for land mitigation certainly is there, and Hannah showed us some evidence of that in her talk today. But the potential is relatively small when compared to the overall requirements needed for climate stabilization, only providing about 5 or 6% of the total mitigation we need. So there's a lot of emerging technologies. For example, algal-based biofuels that take pressure off of land. But we can't rely on theoretical solutions. We don't have time. Arguing that green carbon is our best opportunity for climate change mitigation is like rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. I want to talk about two really important but unconventional agricultural issues that loom very large on the global carbon stage. Only a few decades ago, tropical peatland started to be drained, mostly for palm oil and acacia. Today, more than 20% of Malaysian peatlands have been drained and cultivated. It is not an exaggeration to say that this has been a carbon disaster. In their pristine state, tropical peatlands are resistant to fire until they're drained. In 2015, fires on cleared tropical peatlands produced more emissions than did the whole of Europe. During extreme fire years, these carbon emissions approach global fossil fuel emissions. This issue is not often identified as an agricultural carbon problem, but it is. So let's return home. With warming, many climate models show that a northern expansion of crops. Will boreal and arctic soils be our next agricultural hotspot? A lot of people think so. And this could be a solution to the really high food prices that have plagued the north for a while. So this is great news, emerging opportunities with climate change. But northern soils store twice as much carbon as is contained in the entire atmosphere, way more than tropical soils. So what's going to happen to that soil carbon if we drain and cultivate northern soils? We don't have best management practices, not yet. Add Canadian wildfires to this mix, and we have another recipe for a carbon disaster. Most green carbon studies do not include horizon scans with these emerging issues. And from a carbon perspective, the horizon is not all pretty. Let me conclude. I do think we have a bright future ahead with a lot of ways to reduce agricultural emissions and improve biofuels. But we have a long ways to go before we can reduce those emissions to deal with this problem. There is no silver bullet. We need a big, diverse carbon toolbox. We need a rainbow of carbon colors a portfolio of solutions that we can deploy when and where it makes sense. But until our black carbon problem is taken care of, our most important goal is emissions reductions. And it's going to take effort from all of us with strong policy. There's no technology that can be used to meet the 2 degree centigrade warming target without significant impacts on energy, food, water, or cost. So there is no plan B. We only have plan A. And that plan needs to be based on reducing reliance on fossil fuels. Plan A needs to take a food-first approach, and it needs to avoid deforestation at all cost. Of course, we should enhance soil organic matter where it makes sense and where it benefits soil fertility. But to use it as a mitigation strategy is impractical at best and misleading at worst. We cannot fall into the win-wish trap. Diverting our attention from black carbon is deepening our carbon problem. But if we stay focused on the real issue, the black carbon issue, I think we still have hope. And we can do this.
Uh, okay, then we return to the, so call it the crisis of the debate when each side selects their champion to give both summary and rebuttal. And from here, uh, Stuart Hanna, which, which is it? Okay, let's start. Yeah, oh, go ahead. It's over to you. No. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, we, um, agriculture and uh, forestry will definitely be the answer to mitigate climate change. Of course, we need to reduce the use of fossil fuels as well, but on the other hand, that can only reduce the emissions, but it cannot uh, take the carbon out from the atmosphere. So we, we need really to take a lot of the carbon that is already there uh, out from there and uh, mitigate it in, in the soils and in the uh, vegetations. And uh, we should not wait for the governments to do it because the private sector will do it. Uh, so if you ask uh, people, they are all interested in environment and the future and, uh, and uh, uh, this concept of uh, uh, planetary health is, uh, is um, becoming more common. So understanding that uh, that the environmental issues are not something that happens somewhere outside of us, but they are actually our health problems. So we have to take them seriously uh, if we want to care about our, uh, our children and, uh, and uh, grandchildren. And um, so basically, uh, we all want farmers want to do it. Uh, consumers are interested in paying maybe for more for it and uh, if they are if consumers are not willing to pay more for carbon sequestration then companies will do it automatically so basically um, uh, food industry they are interested in the responsibility issues so they will actually already include this uh, carbon offsetting payment in the prices of the of the products so then the consumers will just uh, buy the food that they like to uh, eat. And uh, at the same time, they actually already offset the, the carbon because there is a small additional amount that will be uh, used for growing trees or, or paying farmers to use farming practices that, um, that uh, mitigate uh, carbon. And uh, also uh, additional payments will come through these uh, ecosystem services. So we wouldn't think only about uh, carbon, but also other ecosystem services. And then on the other hand, the farmers want to do it uh, automatically because uh, they can see that uh, if they don't take care of the soil and uh, add more uh, organic matter into the soil and carbon, then uh, the yields start to suffer in the future because there are more extreme climatic events, uh, drought and uh, uh, heavy rains. So, so only by taking care of the soil and where the soil carbon is really an important issue, that's the only way of uh, 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 keeping the, the productivity of the, of the soil also in the future uh, high. And then regarding how we could uh, grow more forests, that's all to do with the bioeconomy. So there will be more demand for, for wood and, um, and we will use it uh, uh, everywhere. So then we have also more uh, incentives to, to, to grow uh, forest uh, wherever it's, uh, it's possible. And then at, at the same time, we are developing new technologies for producing food and uh, other materials uh, and, um, and also uh, fuels. And uh, these kind of new technologies like the uh, vertical farming and, um, and uh, cellular agriculture will uh, release uh, huge areas uh, of land for, for carbon mitigation. And then still people can continue eating the same, uh, same foods that uh, they are used to eating. So everybody doesn't even need to change for, for vegetarians. So basically, we have 
huge potential in the, in the agriculture and forestry sector to mitigate the climate change and uh, we, should, uh, we should use it and uh, start now acting uh, towards uh, this uh, goal. Thank you. Go ahead. So green carbon is important, absolutely, but we're talking about less than 5% of the total mitigation we need to achieve the less than two degrees centigrade warming target. For every year that we delay reaching peak emissions, the harder and riskier it's gonna to be to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. So I am an optimist, but make no mistake, things are really serious and they're urgent. Our real challenge is the epic scale of this problem. We have carbon emissions at global scales, energy demands that emerge at global scales. We have hundreds of solutions that need to be implemented in tens of thousands of unique locations. This is difficult. And we need to integrate complexities of all types and at all scales, biological complexities, complexities in climate, politics, industry, our complexity, other local populations, and we need to integrate all of this into a global solution. This is difficult. So we need harmony at the grassroots, the political and the industrial levels, focused, trained on the carbon problem. We need to give industry the chance to reorganize and rebuild. We need legislation that provides leadership and that reduces the uncertainty that is currently plaguing our business environment. We need to remove that uncertainty and allow industry to capitalize on the opportunities presented by a carbon market. We need all hands on deck. Looking to any one sector is avoiding the seriousness of our black carbon problem. When examined on paper and in isolation, any emerging technology seems promising. But we also need to be holistic because these technologies interact and often compete with one another. Biofuels and agriculture are often in direct competition with each other for the same shrinking land base. A recent study estimated that 40% of Canadian agricultural lands would need to be converted to biofuels to meet our electricity needs. This is a great start at emissions reduction, but the paper was not based on existing commercial technologies, and it didn't address the limits to food production. We can't estimate the climate benefits of biofuels or forestry without considering the ripple out effects on food. Green carbon strategies often involve compromises with other ecosystem services, and in some situations, these are not acceptable. Biological mitigation often is not transferable. There's really no one approach fits all solution. In many countries, crop residues are already being returned to soil and have been for some time, so we can't count this as having additional climate benefits. In other regions, residues are used for fuel, for cooking, so we can't modify those strategies without affecting livelihood. This is a great example of how a solution might work in one region, but not transferable to another. So the solution does not lie in agriculture or forestry, or in any um, sector. We need to rethink, reform, and revitalize our entire energy system from top to bottom. And we need to invest in stored carbon. For every year that we delay peak emissions, the more we're handing our carbon problem to our children, expecting them to come up with clever, outlandish even, solutions for negative emissions technology. And this is never going to be in agriculture or forestry. This means carbon capture and storage, coupled either with bioenergy or direct air capture. In both of these situations, the carbon is ideally locked in the geosphere. Carbon capture on land might be cheaper, but it's not permanent, so it's risky. There are current commercial facilities that use carbon capture, so this is existing technology. But there's currently no price on sequestered CO2. So these facilities are selling their captured CO2 as a product that has value. That's got to change. We need to value carbon in the ground more than carbon in the air. And that's the only way to solve our carbon problem.
We really are at a crossroads today. We have a very small window for climate stabilization, and it's getting really small. So now is the time to act, to push our policymakers, and to support industrial uh, solutions that are sustainable. We have no time to farm out global warming solutions. We cannot rely on buying time to develop alternative technologies. Because we need carbon solutions now that are food first, permanent, and scalable. It's clear from this that agriculture and forestry are not our best chance for climate change mitigation. Thank you. Informed minds have presented both sides of this in exquisite disquisitions. And now uh, you become the judiciary of this thing. As Morris pointed out at the beginning, it's not a matter of your voting for the motion per se. By the way, correct me if I get this wrong, because most likely I will. It is whether or not from your first vote, which you recorded on the great monkey uh, survey, uh, what is your thought on the same motion now? And we will record uh, whether that has changed, whether it has uh, remained the same, or whether it has been grossly emphasized by the eloquence that you have heard here today. I think uh, before I invite Morris back up here to uh, give us, as we should say, uh, the results of the actual transaction, I think we should thank each of uh, the participants who were here, give an extra special one for those who made such arduous and extended journeys to be here, uh, for, for once more having a, a debate so much superior to those things we normally provide ourselves via News World or CTV Channel News. So thank you to all the debaters. <laughs> And now the, the captain of the conference will take over. So now if I could just uh, uh, check that people who've tried to vote have been able to vote a second time. We're trying to get a tally uh, on the second vote, which is roughly the same as the previous round. So is anybody having difficulty that you want to wave a hand? <coughs> Looks like everybody's had a chance to vote. So I think at this point then, Leanne, we can close the voting and uh, we'll reveal the pre-vote and the post-vote, okay, all will be revealed. So the pre-debate situation, I agree with the proposition, was over 50% there, 54%. I do not agree, uh, was down uh, at about 9% by the looks of it, and then quite a large unsure population. After the debate, as, as you can see, the uh, unsure population decreased substantially and it looks like the opposition has won an awful lot of votes there uh, to the point that they're now into about 45 percent and the, the proposition is down to about 35 percent. So I think uh, uh, that does give us an indication that we've had very high quality debate. I want to congratulate both teams, but particularly the opposition. I think you pulled it off remarkably well.